Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, you can hear me online, those of you who are online. Can you hear me? You said you said that a chat. You can hear me. So we have a song yes, I, yeah. I welcome everybody. I'm very happy and honored to introduce a distinguished colleague on yes. Um, uh, taught at the NYU Camden in our department in 2010. Uh, she's now in the chair of our department as well. We're happy to have her today. She would speak about a new care plan. I'm sorry I didn't memorize your, your title. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, so, yeah, we need to win with that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Leon. Sure. Hi, everyone. So, um, I'm going to present a piece of work that I completed around 2020 at the beginning of the pandemic and which was published in 2021 in computational economics. This way. So the, the main topic is um, monotone finite different schemes for nonlinear partial differential equations arising in finance. There is a theorem uh, by uh, Barlen Suganidis that goes back to 1991 that um, proved the convergence of a monotone consistent and stable approximation to the viscosity solution of a control problem. But a question remained, which was, how do you design a finite different scheme with the above properties? And I've been working on this question on and off since uh, the early 90s. In particular, I wrote an introductory chapter in a book uh, written by Nizar Tuzi in 2013. There are very, very few experts in this area. It's a very small field. Uh, just know a couple. Maybe we have a handful maximum. And the main difficulties are nonlinearities in the equation, degeneracies, and cross derivatives. The primary focus of my talk today. Um, is nonlinearities. What's important to be aware of is that if you try to handle a nonlinear PDE and you use for it a classical finite different scheme, it's likely to diverge. It will become unstable and typically it will blow up. So it's very important to be cautious and to know the more modern theory um, of monotone finite different scheme and learn how to implement those schemes, design them first and then implement them. A question, the second bullet point, so you were saying that for the particular type of nonlinear PDE, there is a theorem that says that there is a Way it, it's not a very particular type. It's all class of nonlinear, possibly degenerate parabolic and elliptic PDEs. So it's a pretty large class of PDEs, okay. parabolic and elliptic. And they emerge from control problems. So uh, the control problems is a subclass. Um, control problems lead to either first order. If, when they are deterministic or second order when they are stochastic, um, elliptic or parabolic partial differential equations, the nonlinear and, and possibly degenerate as well. Like the standard or the application that I, um, I'm going to work with here is to uh, pair trading with transaction costs. 
There are other applications. Um, in optimal for optimal control in finance. I'm going to give you a few examples. You can compute optimal trading strategies, portfolio weights, execution strategies, or lending strategies. Um, but you also have uh, um, a control in some well-known options um, in the passport option or the American option, for instance. The American option is like a toy model for monodon schemes. It's um, nonlinear because you are taking the maximum of two operators, but it's almost linear. It's, it's not bad. And you can actually um, handle the American option by using extensions of linear techniques. The passport option is a bit more nonlinear. But most of my career, I worked on decision models that were not related to options. I don't want to show you the math because um, it's it's too complicated and tedious. I'll, I'll show you a little bit. I'll show you the model, model, but not too much math, but I'm trying to explain in plain English what the ideas are. Um, the point is that elliptic and parabolic PDs satisfy some kind of order preserving property. In the case of the heat equation, it's called the maximum principle. Um, and in the nonlinear case, it's called the comparison principle. These are, are similar. And so a monodon scheme is a scheme that satisfies the same order comparison property as the original PDE. In practice, you have to impose monotonicity constraints on the scheme. And, and finally, I just want to um, add that when you are dealing with a complex equation with several variables and several types of terms, it's useful to use a time splitting method to separate the different operators or different variables. And I will uh, use that here. Now let's talk about the application. Um, in 2013, I wrote a very simple um, optimal control problem for pairs trading that could be solved explicitly. Uh, of course, it's simplistic. It was made to be solvable explicitly. I had an exponential utility function that allowed me to factor out the wealth variable, leading to a reduction of the number of dimensions. Um, this problem, this model, this original model had a big practical issue, which was that you could observe a run up on, on leverage. You would just, you know, um, take larger and larger position while you waited for the spread to reconverge to the T equilibrium. So in the work I'm talking about today, I made the model a bit more sophisticated, a little more, by adding a transaction cost. I tested two types of models for the transaction cost, a linear and a square root model. And to add a constraint on the gross exposure because the transaction costs alone are not really sufficient to prevent a run up on leverage. I also seek market neutral strategies. Um, that's a brief description of, of what the model is. I will give you more details in a few minutes. And in that context, um, my co-author and I could build a nonlinear 
monotone finite different scheme to, to solve it because we could no longer find explicit solutions. I can tell you a story about my co-author, Zikun. She was a master's student in the department and she worked on a thesis with me. That's when we started um, writing the model and designing the scheme. And now she's a PhD student at um, the Stevens Institute in New Jersey. Oh, she's, she's very good, she's very strong. Um, so at first she didn't want to trust me. I told her, uh, you know, we need to build a modern scheme, a classical scheme won't work. And then she went around, she talked to a few of my colleagues and, and then she implemented the scheme and she came to me and she said, it doesn't work. So I looked into it, I asked her, what did you do? And, and then I realized, but it's not monotone. And she said, oh, but I talked to so-and-so and they told me that that would work, there wouldn't be any problem. <laughs> so I said, you know, almost nobody knows this field. They, they just don't know, they, they're not familiar with this, um, with this uh, type of situations. So uh, we sat together, we redesigned a monotone scheme, which was not uh, very simple. And, and that gave birth to that, um, that piece of work and that paper that we have together. So I'm going to describe the model um, and not the scheme because the scheme is, is complicated, but at least the model. So that's a model for co-integrated assets um, in, in just two dimensions. We have two assets here. It can be generalized easily to more, more dimensions. And I have a paper in, um, um, in, in uh, higher number of dimensions that we applied to cryptocurrencies. Uh, so you see, uh, you have asset prices. They follow more or less what looks like an arithmetic model, not too far from it. On purpose, I chose it arithmetic because uh, it makes all the calculations way easier. And it's, okay, it's a model that um, it is pretty good in the case of high frequency data. So it's, it's okay. And there is this extra term in here compared to a simple arithmetic model. Um, Z here represents the spread between the two assets. So it is defined as that linear combination of the two asset prices where beta um, needs to be estimated. Um, some people would take beta equal to negative one. It can be perfectly fine um, for a lot of applications. Um, alternately, you can estimate beta if you think that you can have, get an estimate that's relatively accurate. Um, so, of, co of course, we know, unfortunately, that these models are very hard to it's rare to estimate the parameters of these models. It's inaccurate, we know that. Um, they don't have, they're pretty simple. They don't have a lot of terms and, and the estimations are relatively poor. This said, um, the test um, for the, um, that we conducted for cryptocurrencies, I was with another co-author, Paul Lintilak, were giving us pretty good results, even out of sample test. So let's continue presenting this model. You can differentiate the spread and that leads to a basic check interest rate model, right? A OU model where the speed um, and the long run mean can be written in terms of the, the parameters of the previous model. So you could start directly with the spread. I chose to show the model for the original asset prices. You don't necessarily have to do it this way. So you see it's mean reverting. 
um, you have Z mean routing to the equilibrium eta at the spin alpha. Now, what else? Um, we are going to all the shares of the two assets. We are gonna have pi one uh, shares of um, the first asset, pi two shares of the second asset, and we're imposing a market neutral condition, which for us here is written that way, where beta is the parameter in the spread. So we can reduce that pair to just a single pi, which would represent the number of shares of first asset held. Then we prevent the rate of trading from becoming infinite. So we assume that pi can be written this way. That, that is, does, um, that deep, that the derivative of pi exists in some way, okay? And V will be the rate of trading. It can be positive, it can be negative. Um, now we have to derive the equations and add transaction costs and constraints on the gross exposure. I denote by K of T, the value of the money market account at time T. I differentiate the, um, the wealth. I write the dynamics for the wealth. I assume that the price that we observe is the same as the decision price. However, the execution price will differ from the observable price. <clears throat> um, so S1 tilde is to tilde at the execution prices. You add to the observed prices some cost that is um, a function of the um, rate of trading. Uh, we can take a linear model but we can also consider a square root model. Oh, it's not um, showing up completely. The bottom of the slides actually. Um, right, thank you. Um, so the square root model. These are models that were uh, proposed in the literature. I didn't invent these. They are not necessarily the most up-to-date, maybe not the most sophisticated. There are other ways of um, expressing a model like this, but I wanted it to be pretty simple and convenient enough because the scheme is, is a little complicated. Any, any question, any problem? Is that okay? <clears throat> I take um, R equal to zero, the interest rate is zero here. I can add it back in, but it just makes the equation simpler. Um, and I write the dynamics for the money market account, uh, which is used for paying um, the, the trades. So the transaction costs go into the money market account, they're withdrawn from the money market account. <clears throat> and, you know, you put these equations together and that gives you the dynamics of the wealth process, which uh, contains the transaction cost. In the linear case, right? This derivation is in linear case. In the square root, for the square root model, you have to write, write the equations that are different. So in the end, you get um, three uh, equations for the state variables of your system. You have a system which um, is described by the wealth variable, by the spread, <clears throat> and by um, the, the number of shares. These are your variables. 
And I will use a utility function. I know it's already not popular um, in some circles. Um, the reason why I'm using it is because it's convenient, first of all, for what I'm going to do. And secondly, it's because after all, the, uh, we, the reward risk structure, the reward risk trade-off structure is pretty rich uh, in a utility function. After all, it does correspond to a risk measure that, that is a, a true risk measure that satisfies the axioms of a risk measure. It, it, is, it has a good risk reward profile. So uh, I'll use that. And then we set up an optimization problem. Uh, first of all, I write uh, constraints on the number of shares that we can hold. That's my constraint on that limits my exposure. I can just keep increasing pi, waiting to reconverge. And I defined um, the optimal value function. I maximize the expected um, utility derived from the terminal wealth. And I derived the PDE corresponding to that problem. So that's the PDE that I have. Some of the terms are linear, as you can see, but the supremum here is very linear. It's the control part of it that's nonlinear. And it comes with a terminal condition. And it comes with boundary condition at pi min and pi max. Um, the boundary conditions are not very standard. They are called states constraints, but they're very easy to implement in practice. So when you have an equation like that, usually you use a theory of viscosity solution to study its well poisonous. Okay, I won't show any of that. Um, how do we derive the scheme in just a few points without showing you how it looks like? We factor out the wealth variable by using the appropriate NSATs. And then we obtain a PD in the variable Z and uh, pi. So we only have two variables left. We use a time splitting method to separate the variable Z and pi. So in other words, we split the PD in two operators, one for each variable at each time step. We don't do that once and, and solve the PD separately. At each time step, we solve both. We have alpha iteration. We solve one and then the other, and then the first one and the second one and so on. Okay, at each iteration. We built a monotone fire different scheme for each operator. And um, we implement the sense constraint boundary condition by um, restricting ourselves to um, the set of controls that points inside the domain. Now, do we achieve uh, monotonicity? Any question first? I'm going relatively fast, um, so I could take questions. The control, that, yeah, it's a good question. I could have um, said that when we were here or in the PD, uh, on the PD. The control variable here is V, actually. It's the trading rate. And pi is a state variable. So we track the number of shares that we are holding. We make the decision on V, what is the trading rate? Okay, because I made the cost depend on the trading rate. That's how this is set up. Okay. So in the PD, the control comes in here. We are maximizing that expression over the trading rate.
Right, exactly, exactly, yes. So if you look back, yes, so you pick V that determines pi, and, and then um, you're observing Z, and then the, the wealth depends on the value of Z and the policies that you are choosing. And the cost, the, the yeah, the transaction cost. Now, I want to explain more how you uh, can achieve the monotonicity, monotonicity, sorry, monotonicity of the scheme. Uh, so roughly, the idea is to select upwind finite differences rather than centered finite differences. Yeah. So once we separate out the and you saying that at every step we solve for both. So once you separate it out, why is why are there two differences that we should solve it? Um, they have very different schemes. They are different variables. One is linear, the other one is not. So they are very different schemes. So we apply the, the schemes alternatively at each time step. Yes, yeah, we cannot separate them over the whole time interval. We separate them at each time step. It's local. We can separate them locally, but not globally in time. That, that would be completely wrong mathematically. Any other question? Okay, so um, it's not just a matter of saying, okay, I'm going to take one forward finite difference or one backward finite difference, it's a bit more complicated because you are going to end up with a function of both the forward and backward finite difference. Okay, so you get a function of finite differences. I'll give you a very simple example next, which is not related to this model. It's a completely different model, but its merit is that it's simple. You can't expect this type of scheme to be very accurate. Uh, the theory shows that the accuracy is even less than uh, first order. Um, maybe um, the theory is not sharp. Maybe it's first order accurate. I don't know, but it's not, it's, it's not very accurate. The reason why um, we are doing this is because it's it's robust. That's the whole point. We choose robustness over accuracy here. We don't really have the choice. If we don't choose robustness, it's not going to converge at all. Um, and for nonlinear equation, you have this trade-off between robustness and accuracy. We are not really able here to build a fully implicit scheme for this particular PD because of the time splitting in particular. And so the scheme is only going to be monotone under a constraint on the time step, a CFL condition. The time step won't be, um, will have to be uh, small enough compared to the other steps in space for pi and for z. All right, here's my simple example, which is not related to this um, pair trading model. You take the a conal equation in one dimension with a constant right hand side. The solution of that is the absolute value of x. The absolute value of X is a viscosity solution of this equation. It's actually the unique viscosity solution of this equation. 
Now, a uh, Mondelian scheme for this equation is that one. So it's nonlinear and it depends on the forward finite difference and backward finite difference, both of them. And it, it can be um, inverted. It looks implicit, but it can be inverted in an efficient way. And it is being used in a lot of STEM fields because it's considered a, a really good scheme for that type of equation. So that's the idea, constructing something like that. That's exactly what we are doing, except that it's in now case here, it looks more tedious and I don't want to show uh, how this is done. Well, I'm almost at the, at the results, right? I'm already at the results. Any question first? <laughs> I don't want to show the ugly, ugly calculations, so. All right, some results then. We didn't uh, test this, um, this model on uh, real data. We just uh, perform simulations. If you want to see tests on real data, I re you can go see my paper on cryptocurrencies on Bitcoin in several markets. Um, so that's one simulated path. You can see the spread, which starts pretty high. The equilibrium level here is zero. It starts pretty high, it stays there for a while, and then it converges to the equilibrium. That's a trading rate. You start with a negative number of shares. No, sorry, it's just a control. Here you start with a zero number of shares and, and you update your, your position. Um, here, that's the total wealth. So for a while, it kind of goes down because the spread stays high and then it builds up when the spread reconverges. It's a nice, of course, it, I picked a nice path, right? It's not always like that. You might, you could lose too. Um, but it's easy to find that nice path that illustrates um, what happens with the model. So, you know, with a model like that, the model is perfect, right? It's, it's a model, so it works very well. But of course, I mean, in theory, of course, if it fits the data, it can still work in, in real life. But as soon as the co-integration phenomenon breaks down, you have to stop using the model because that can be a disaster. It works until it doesn't. It doesn't work all the time. Yeah. In both models, so this this trading path that's shown here, the last right, that's the one that maximizes the expected value. Is that what yes. So it's the solution of the optimal control problem, but just for one scenario, just for one path. Oh, so for one path. Yeah, it's it's optimized, but just for one path, just one scenario, one possible scenario. So you're not allowing the spread to stochastic then? No, it is. No, it is um, one sample path. So it's one outcome. It's one omega. It's one. I pick a sample. It's a sample. Okay. So it does that. Model says that's the optimal number of shares. I understand. That's better. So that's what happens to the spread. And the model says, that's the, the number of shares that exactly. The model is, you know, a PD model is deterministic. So you are working in terms of the variables. So you observe the spread and you you uh, compute the optimal strategy for every given value of the spread. And even for every position pi, starting position pi as well, pi is also variable. But anything that the fact that when spread seems to normalize very quickly, the trading rate goes up, there's Intuition behind that, that you're trading more, like 
Uh, so it, it's negative, the trading rate all along. So it gets to zero actually here, right? It's, neg it starts, it's negative at the beginning. So it's the opposite. You stop trading at the end, you wind down, you stop trading when you arrive around the end of that time period. Okay. Yep. It's just that I'm not sure it's whether it's but yeah, right. Um, yeah, no, I was feeling it was falling down. All right, thank you. <laughs> um, yep. What is? Yeah, it can be negative or positive. It is what it is. The optimal control problem tells you what it is. Here, it turns out to be negative in that situation. Um, so it depends on your starting position. You start with uh, zero shares. So we start from scratch and then, and then, yeah. So if the trading rate is negative, then you, you are shorting. You are shorting the first asset and taking a long position on the second one, assuming that beta is negative one. Okay. All right, just a picture of the optimal value function. It's not very um, exciting in practice maybe, but just wanted to show it. It looks smooth and nice, no uh, weird oscillation. Um, and then I have a picture for the trading rate. So it's in terms of the number of shares held and the value of the spread. That's the trading rate. It's these are for the linear um, transaction cost model. Um, that's the line along which um, the trading rate is zero. So on one side, it's negative. On the other side, it's positive. And here along that line, it, it's zero. So you don't trade along that line. Yeah. Well, steep, you know, it depends on how you plot the picture too. Yeah. Um, so the question of scale too, um, I have to choose some boundaries for Z. Um, at the boundaries, we're gonna have errors. So I'm gonna have to have boundaries that's really far away from this area that I want to compute accurately. That's one reason. So the picture is large, but I'm really interested in this area particularly, okay. So yeah, Z, I, I, could, I, thought I cut off the domain for Z. And there's going to be some additional error at the edges of the domain for Z. I hope that the error is confined um, in, in a boundary layer and it decreases exponentially as I move away from the boundary. There's, there's results on this, but not, not for this particular model. And then these are the pictures for the square root um, transaction model. They look different, right? So we'd better figure out which model is the best because the results are different. The model is a bit sensitive to the kind of to the choice that we make here. Um, that's the trading rate, and that's the no trade curve. It looks a little similar to the the other one. Now, uh, we perform a lot of tests. Of course, we are not going to allow that model to run for 10 years. That would never happen. But I just wanted to know the behavior of the model in the long run. So we see um, that in the long run, uh, provided, of course, the model fits the data, which is not going to happen for 10 years, the percentage of profitable path goes up. And 
this is the curve representing the mean and the standard deviation of the, of the wealth after one year, two years, and so on. And then we uh, computed a lot of statistics for the solution. These are for the linear transaction cost case. So we looked at a, a lot of um, a lot of quantities to have an idea of how the the optimal solution behaves. Um, we uh, look also at the square root case. The statistics are a little different, though not that different. If you look at the number of paths ending with positive wealth, they are similar in both cases. We have 69% here, 70% and 70% there. Um, the max trading rate looks different, looks much bigger in the square root case. That, that's a big difference. Here I make the transaction cost parameter vary. And I looked at the same statistics again for various values of the transaction cost parameter. Of course, as it increases, things are going to, good, going to look less good. The number of path ending with positive wealth goes down. The utility that you can achieve is lower. The average terminal wealth is a lot lower. Um, the max profit also is a lot lower. And the max loss is lower as well. Um, and so on. So it, it varies quite a bit in a direction that seems uh, um, intuitively correct. Here, I, I let the, the bound on the position vary for the linear um, cost model. So here, uh, we have less constraint as we um, increase pi, we have less constraint. We can hold a uh, uh, higher number of positions. And that increases a little bit the terminal wealth. I mean, the average terminal wealth. It um, it actually decreases. I don't know if that's very um, accurate. It decreases the number of path ending with a terminal wealth, if that's accurate enough. Um, the max profit. Um, increases up to now, but not um, once we increase further from 10 to 20 extra. So it's a, a bit harder to um, interpret than uh, the other um, the other panels. Sometimes increasing a pi, the concern of pi is not necessary. Anyway, it wouldn't be necessary to actually use that extra margin. Uh, sometimes um, it, it does make you take more risk. We also let the volatility coefficient vary and again computed the statistics. That's for the linear cost model. These are the references. Um, I want to say that um, The computational burden is fairly high. It depends on the accuracy that you want, right? If you have a very coarse grid, then you know you get the results in a few seconds. I, I did push the calculations here by using um, finer mesh, and that can take hours. Why right? the finer the mesh, the longer it takes. 
So it, of course, um, you have a set of parameters here, and every time you want to change your parameters, then you're gonna have to recompute the whole solution. Okay. Um, well, for a course grid, it's pretty quick. And that's about it. I can take a few questions. We can stop early. <laughs> Up to you. Yeah. I, I, I'm a novice. Uh, my it's fine. Of, of full integration is I've got like two stock prices, and some linear combination of the changes is stationary. We, right, right, right. That's the most naive definition. But it's the same. Okay. So it, now, it's the same. But, but go back way in the beginning when you, mm -hmm. when you, when you code the code integration. Right. The it's stuff. the same. So I can explain a little more. Um, when you code that, so. Um, Right, so here, um, the the asset prices are not stationary. Uh, the, the increments of the Brownian motions are stationary, but not the asset prices. But Z is, is stationary in the long run because it satisfies this model which is stationary in the long run. It's an OU model. That number beta, that increments of that linear combination, then I would not the case that every future t the expected value is the same and what i'm saying is like to me integration means that um the for every increment of every new combination the mean is the same it's a stationary so in the long run as the time goes to infinity you um convert your stationary distribution okay. but, but it's not a not true that it's not true. Let's say that the the um, whatever time I'm at, the change in the change in that linear combination will be the, at the same mean. That's not true. No, I don't think so. so like and today, the expected value of the change of that linear combination will be the same as expected value of it tomorrow, and that, that's not true. Right? It's not true. Only in some kind of limit is that right. Only the limit is the have a stationary you expect the dynamic mean is zero basically in the limit right so yeah the limit you get a normal distribution uh with the uh, mean um era if i'm not making a mistake and and um and also a constant volatility constant right. variance so the limit of the mean of dt is like that a or so mm. Um, so Z converts to, no, eta, eta, the mean is eta. That's the equilibrium. That's the equilibrium. But this was the same naive notion of co-integration. Like yeah, it's not so naive because a lot of people um, think that co-integration is just looking at correlations. That one is more naive. A lot of people think that, you know, correlation means that the assets price as following one another, and that's that's what best trading is about. I shouldn't say co-integration is just about correlation. I should say some people think that pair trading is about correlations. But um, co-integration is a more sophisticated model that works better than just correlations. Oh, negative prices, right, right. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that could be that could be a problem. Yeah, the, that's the problem with the arithmetic model, right? The prices can get negative at times. Um, yeah, that's why we prefer the geometric brine in motion most of the time. That's what we use in Black Shores. Um, here, uh, this one is more convenient. Otherwise, you know, what, what you could do here is you would have to start from a GBM model and, and look at the co-integration of the log prices. That's another way of looking at it. You take log prices, which are co-integrated. 
Um, in um, people who work on the microstructure, on the market microstructure and build models, often like using the arithmetic model because it tends to be more to fit the data better um, for I, when when the data are is at high frequency. You observe this multiplicative effect uh, in, in the long run for a longer term, but for short term, the arithmetic model can be better. Oh, there are several ways. That's a good question. There are several ways. I don't even remember how we did it for this paper. I did it in several ways over time. Um, there's one test I like, which is the Johansson test, the Johansson approach, because with it, and it's implemented in MATLAB, you can do all at once. It can give you all the parameters at once. It's, it's based on that type of model, which in discrete time is, um, um, I mean, that, yeah, is a VEC model. And it can give you absolutely all the parameters in, in, in one, um, with, the, with just one function. Otherwise, you have you can proceed in several steps. Start with beta, yeah, we do a regression and start with beta and so on. Anything else? Right, maybe we can stop here. Right. Thank you. Well, it's never been so on time. <laughs> You're right on time.